So the next slide is our team in solidarity. And I think this is telling because we're all wearing teal, teal green, which is a color of the um, cervical cancer. Um, and um, at the end, I'm going to explain what we were actually doing here. We, we don't usually come out every morning to do this before we start work. This was a, a very um, intentional photograph and I will explain what we were actually up to. So um, I've always found a case study something that helps to really bring it home. You know, this isn't a lecture. Uh, I'm not a cancer epidemiologist. Um, so it's not meant to, you know, be a tutorial. I just want to flag up a couple of things and then throughout the discussion there. So I'll start off with a case study. And this is a real case. Um, a 67 year old uh, lady, para nine, Jehovah's Witness, 16 years post-menopause, um, came in with a diagnosis, histological diagnosis of invasive non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix with in endometrial involvement. And this was staged at 2B, okay? Um, her first, you know, her first knowledge that something was wrong was in October, 2019. So again, this deals with some of the symptoms that you can have with cervical cancer. So she noticed vaginal bleeding with associated low abdominal pain and offensive vaginal discharge. So vaginal discharge, vaginal bleeding and low abdominal pain. So a few months later, um, she came to lecture. She had been to a private clinic and they did a couple of investigations and got a diagnosis. And in December, 2019, she came down to make sure with all the investigations and the complaints. What was very telling in her history, and that's where history is so crucial. Um, what when you get investigations, you're really sus sus supporting um, the history you already have. By the end of history taking, your mind is telling you a couple of diagnoses potential. And so what was telling in her history was that in her lifetime, she's a 67 year old woman, she had only done one pap smear, one pap smear, whether it was the traditional pap smear or the liquid-based cytology, which is a gold standard. She had only done one pap smear in her lifetime. She had no history of multiple sexual partners and no associated risk factors. So um, the treatment was a combination of chemo, radiation and brachytherapy. And this was done over a seven week period and Subsequently, in August 2020, this year, um, last year, we had a repeat CT scan of the abdominal pelvic region. And um, this showed findings consistent with a known case of carcinoma of the cervix, certainly, but no cervical or uterine mass was found, no evidence of nodal or metastatic disease, no significant finding on the scan. This is good news. This is certainly good news. So this lady is now asymptomatic with performance status of zero, which means basically she's going about her life. She's doing everything as normal. And she's currently on a three monthly follow-up with the gyne, gyne oncologist and the clinical radiation oncologist. So what this highlights is that this lady was diagnosed at a stage that things could be done. She didn't come in with advanced cancer. And if we remember the stages of cancer, it's zero to four. What you want is a zero and a one, you know, not that we want a cancer, but if you're going to have a diagnosis, you want it as early as possible because you have a higher chance of cure, you have less morbidity, you have less mortality, um, you have a higher chance of going back to your life, and, um, you know, it's all around good news, even financial, because the certainty is that you might just stick to one regimen. When you come in advanced cancer, what then happens is the doctors are really struggling to find what is going to be the best regimen. Sometimes you have to repeat something, you have to go back to another thing. And importantly, the person is unwell. And financially, there's a lot of outgoing. You know, we don't have a lot of health insurance here that covers long-term cancer. And so with this lady, 
the message is that cervical cancer is highly preventable and treatable if found early. Regular cervical screening and vaccination to prevent HPV infections are readily available. And I want to mention something about the pap smear. If this lady had only one pap smear in her duration from whenever she became sexually active to 67 when she was diagnosed, it means that actually, if she had been having regular pap smear, the chances are this might have been picked up sooner. It takes quite a while from the HPV, vac um, HPV infection to a cervical cancer manifestation. And at some point, if she was having her regular pap, what could happen is before she even got a diagnosis of cancer, the lab would have been able to detect that there were changes already taking place, place in the cervix, whether it was just the presence of HPV, human papilloma virus, or the pre presence of um, changes within the cells in the cervix, you know, without it being cancer. And of course, cancer is the end, um, the outcome, if nothing is done or picked up over that period. So this lady is very lucky. We are going to be monitoring her we obviously wish her the very best and we hope for the very best, um, but we're not going to relax because she was a stage 2B. So a few cervical cancer facts. Um, again, like I said, it's not going to be a lecture. I'm not going to go into the pathophysiology or, you know, I think, you know, we all have a basic knowledge of that. But just to mention a few things about cervical cancer, almost all cases, 99% are linked to infection with high risk human papilloma virus, HPV, which is an extremely common virus transmitted through sexual contact. If you're sexually active and you don't need to have multiple sexual partners, at some point you would have come in contact with the HPV. It's not necessarily even termed a, an STD, sexually transmitted disease in that sense. It's such a normal virus that most often you don't have, know that you got it because the immune system is actually able to clear it. And so what we are dealing with is a virus that then possesses, usually the high risk ones, 16, 18, and a couple of others, they persist and then begin to, you know, cause changes around the cervix. And it takes a while, which is why it's always sad when someone turns up with an advanced case of cervical cancer. It takes a couple, more than a couple of years to, you know, go do that journey. Then cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women around the world. In 2018, an estimated 570,000 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer worldwide and about 311,000 died from the disease. So this suggests that these women were coming late and I'm sure the bulk of these women are women from the low to middle income countries. When diagnosed, cervical cancer is one of the most successfully treatable forms of cancer, as long as it's detected early and managed effectively. So that's key, early detection. And if you have a comprehensive approach to prevent, to screen, to treat, it can be eliminated as a public health problem within a generation. Yes, the United Kingdom managed to do this. In the 70s, the United Kingdom had similar statistics like we have currently, which in a way gives me hope. And when they then got this program, you know, prevent, treat and screen, they instituted a national cervical cancer screening program, which meant that automatically, once you register with a general practitioner and you're within that age bracket, in the UK it's 25, they start from 25 to send out letters to recall you in for your screening. In other places it's 21, in the US it's 21, in Nigeria it's 21, in some European countries it's 21. But the important thing is there is a national screening program, which means that every three years you get a letter automatically at your door, reminding you to go to your general practitioner to get your screening done. And within a generation, their numbers completely changed. So it is possible for Nigeria to achieve this. So 
this is the previous slide. This is information from WHO, just to acknowledge uh, my reference. And then this is another important element I wanted to share. ICO, IARC, HPV Information Center. So this report has just come out. So it's hot, hot, hot report with information. And this is going to be the report for Nigeria. If you want to read the full report, all I've done is just picked a couple of things. Please go online, it's there. I haven't even finished going through its pages because it, just, it doesn't deal with just the cervical cancer. It deals with all the HPV related diseases, you know, oral cancer, laryngeal cancer, and it's a good read. So what is IS, ICO? It's the Catalan Institute of Oncology and they are collaborating with the World Health, well, initially they collaborated with the general WHO, but now they've narrowed it to collaborating with the IARC, which is the International Agency for Research uh, on Cancer, and it's an agency of the WHO. And what they are doing is they are coordinating HPV information, um, you know, checking for epidemiological data, across the 194 WHO member states. And here we are. So this is our own information. In about uh, 20, these are estimates for 2020, we had about 12,075 new cervical cancer cases uh, annually and 7,968 deaths. 7,968 deaths. That is heartbreaking. And I'm in Nigeria, cervical cancer is ranked as the second leading cause of female cancer. And cervical cancer is also the second most common female cancer in women aged 15 to 44 years in Nigeria, 15 to 44 years. Look at that age. So again, information here, the prevalence of HPV 16 and HPV 18, which are the ones I mentioned are very common in you know, cervical cancer. Now, prevalence is the presence of. So if I collect a sample from the clinic, a woman has come in with um, a normal routine screening, no complaints of anything, and I send it off to the lab. The lab sends me a result back and says this is a normal um, cervical screening in terms of I can't find, we can't find any cells that are abnormal. However, 3.5% will still have the presence of HPV there. Then you start having the samples that have different changes occurring. So you have low-grade cervical lesions, you have high-grade cervical lesions, and then you come to cervical cancer. By the time you come to cervical cancer, you will have at least 66.9% showing HPV. So you can see that HPV is a very important causative um, you know, a factor for cervical cancer. Again, it's now well established that it is the cause. Um, and we also find that there's growing evidence, as I mentioned before, that it's also becoming a relevant factor in other endogenital cancers, um, anus, vulva, vagina, penis, and head and neck cancers. And that is why when they, if they um, initially, there was a vaccine, Severix, and it covers HPV 16 and 18. But because of all these other um, cancers linked to HPV, Gardasil now has a wider coverage. And the most um, recent one is Gardasil 9, because it's covering other HPV uh, subtypes that can cause these other uh, cancers. But for now, concentrating on cervical cancer in women, 16 and 18 are responsible for about 70% of all cervical cancers worldwide. So it is fact. HPV vaccination has great potential to reduce the incidence of not just cervical cancer, but other cancers, endogenital cancers. So, um, you know, just linking it back to the topic, and this is where we are, Cervical Cancer Elimination Global Strategy 2030. And this was launched 17th of Sorry, that's meant to be, I'm not sure why I'm in October. This was launched in 17th of November, 2020, last year. And I'll quote Dr. Tedros. Um, and he says, what are the strategies for elimination? 
So through cost-effective evidence-based interventions, including human papilloma virus vaccination of girls, screening, so, you know, you do the vaccination, one, then screening and treatment of precancerous lesions, so you do your screening, and then improving access to diagnosis and treatment of invasive cancers. We can eliminate cervical cancer as a public health problem and make it a disease of the past. And this is through cost-effective evidence-based interventions. And these exist now. So it's not as if we're going to start from scratch. They exist. There are countries that have these interventions already in place and their numbers are down. So again, this is just the life course, uh, what's called the life course approach. It's just repeating exactly what I've just talked about. You have what's called the primary prevention, the secondary prevention and the tertiary prevention. So just going back to basics again, primary prevention is that you want to prevent the disease even before it's started. And that means you're looking at all the possible risk factors. So in addition to the vaccination, which reduces the risk, you're also looking at things like education, sexual health education amongst you know, um, teenagers, young people, sexually active people. You're also talking about things like smoking. You're talking about other things because you still have the 1% not caused by HPV. And that means that you're also looking at other risk factors that, that can cause cancer. Then you have the secondary prevention, which is where you are screening. Again, you start off below the 30 years of age to screen these women and you're using true and tested evidence-based um, methods. So at the moment, we have about three that are very popular. So you have the VIA, visual inspection with acetic acid. I'm starting with that, even though that's not the gold standard, but that is the one method that catches mass, when you're thinking of mass, um, um, mass screening in a low resource environment, then that is what you use. It's not as sensitive, it's not as specific, but it gives you an idea. Okay, something is wrong. It doesn't tell me it's a cancer, but I can at least do something, do a basic treatment. So this is what we use in an environment like Nigeria where we have absolutely no national, you know, there's nothing going on in terms of uh, uh, at the national level. So this is being used, it's cheap, it's cheap, um, and at least it's doing something. Now, traditionally, we had the pap smear, which was used for a number of years, and then the pap smear then got upscaled to what's called the LBC, liquid-based cytology, which a lot of private facilities actually use. We still have the traditional one. The LBC is just slightly more expensive, but the same collection method, the same, the only thing that is different is that the, the way they, it's preserved when you get the sample, th that means that you are having less damage to the cells effectively. By the time it gets to the lab, the pathologists are able to see more viable cells. So you have less um, false negatives and false positives, that sort of thing. It reduces all that, the bias. So secondary prevention. Uh, and then of course, if you're doing the VIA, it says there, followed by immediate treatment or as quickly as possible, when you see things that suggest there might be a precancerous lesion. Then tertiary prevention is when you know this is an abnormality, this is a cancer, and you then have to go ahead and treat, whether it's surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, or your palliating, meaning that you're not doing any active treatment, but you are supporting the patient, you know, the symptoms. So again, the WHO then came up with this catchy, you know, ratio, 90 to 70 to 90. And what does it mean? For the primary prevention through HPV vaccines, what the expectation with this uh, 2030 um, strategy is that 90% of girls should be fully vaccinated by age 15 years. Now, the guidelines for the vaccination is between the ages of nine and 26. So most of the vaccines, that is what the guidelines suggest. So primary, um, secondary school students are the right targets, the right age brackets. So 
90% of girls should be fully vaccinated by age 15 years. So that's the 90%. Then 70% is targeting the secondary prevention, which is the early detection and the treatment of precancer. And what it's saying is 70% of women that are screened with the, should be screened with a high performance test by 35 years of age and by 45 years of age. So anytime you meet women in the clinic, you know, by 35 years of age, they should be in the flow of screening. If you meet another, a 45 year old woman, you, the woman should be in that same cycle of screening. And then the last 90% is when you do see a woman with um, a diagnosis. So it's saying that 90% of women diagnosed should receive treatment. So it's not a case of there's no treatment, there's no access. When a woman is diagnosed, the next thing is tertiary prevention. They should have either of the four treatment modalities. And that is what this global strategy is aiming for in nine years. This is what in Nigeria, these are the these are our targets effectively. So again, you know, a national cancer cervical cancer screening program based on income. I just wanted to show the slide to show us where we are. This is saying, and this was done by the World Bank in Income Group. It's saying, it's, I mean, it's interesting all the different groups that are actually collecting data around this. And it's saying that the percentage of countries with a national cervical cancer screening program, and you have the high income, they are hitting almost 80%. You have the upper middle income, 70%, lower middle income countries about, I think between 50 and 60, low income, we're at about between 30 or close to about 38%, I guess. And they've just circled it there, 9% in Nigeria. So we have a, a lot of work to do. So what are the challenges in Nigeria? And I've actually not put any suggestions here. This is what we are going to discuss now. This is what I want to bring to the table for all of us to say, you know, give ideas. Um, having sort of gone through all the facts, the question now is what do we do? Where do we go from here? Um, like Liz said, six days from now, we are marking the one year, the one year anniversary from this launch. And I'm actually interested in finding out from the people who are on here, did you hear about this global strategy launch? And if you did, in the past one year, have you, you know, have you got any information that something is actually happening within our own country? You know, are you getting uh, messages asking you to come in for your screening? Or if you're a doctor, are you now screening patients? You know, is there a sense that something active, something really, you know, enthusiastic is happening? And if not, what are the challenges we face? So I'm actually going to cheat and really throw the discussion open at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Oge. This has been a very uh, engaging and practical uh, conversation. I'm, I'm quite pleased that, you know, it's, it's taking sort of like a detour from uh, the, the regular way we have our web, webinar sessions. Uh, and I like that this is a question for everyone, but I'd just like to say that, um, there have been several takeaways take away for, for me, very eye-opening, and, and it speaks too much about the importance of data, you know, how data shows you uh, where you're coming from, where you're currently, and where you're going. So um, just before we open the floor for people to start, to, you know, share their uh, thoughts or responses to the question you asked about whether they've even heard about this or gotten a sense of um, action towards advancing this uh, global strategy, I want to just say that this is... Um, this is such an, an eye opener for everyone uh, about the importance of what's happening and the possibilities that are bound. Because, like the example you gave uh, at the beginning of the session about what has happened in the United Kingdom, you know, it just shows that there's hope that if we adopt, you know, and there's collective um, sort of efforts around, you know, sort of like a comprehensive approach across all levels of, of the healthcare uh, system, then there is hope that our numbers can can reduce and this. 
prevalence, you know, the outcomes can start to change. So thank you so much for sharing this. And thank you for the data that you've shared. It's quite eye-opening. Uh, I'm going to go look at that report. <laughs> I'm making a commitment. And I hope that everyone else also does, this, does the same so that we can take this from here. So the floor is open. I'd like to um, ask Dr. Ogi had asked um, if anyone has heard and they would, they would want to share. So the floor is open. Um, you can unmute your mic and, and share. And if you'd also want us to call names, we, we are happy to do that. <laughs> Since this, this is already looking, looking like a traditional classroom uh, type of situation. So we'll be, we'll be happy to make the conversation that way as well. Thank you, Yemisi. I see you've unmuted your mic. Would you like to share? Oh, thank you very much. This is Yemisi Balogun. Um, actually, mine is not a question as such, but I just want to ask that how can we effectively let the common people the, 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 to, to let Nigerians know that this cervical cancer screening is going on and where can it be done? Okay, thank you, Yemesi. So speaking of advocacy efforts, thank you. We'll note that question down for Dr. Oge, but First, before you, um, you, you mute your mic, the question for you is, yeah. have you heard about, prior to this conversation, have you, have you heard about the, the WHO global strategy? And have you been privy to any um, activities going on about it? Have you heard before now? Um, actually, I haven't heard about this WHO uh, strategy, strategy, but um, I have been part of the um, cervical cancer screening in a Rotary Club because we we're trying to oh. immunize some um, girls, and um, we um, we ask we wanted to immunize 300 girls, but unfortunately, I think we could only get 58. Mm. We registered six, but at the end of it, two um, parents said no because they have to sign okay. to do the immunization. Mm. Mm. Thing. But we still ask the girls to mm. come along with their friends so that at least they will see what is going on. They will know that it's not something that they are bringing out a knife or something to cut them. Mm. Yeah. Interesting example. Thank you. And this sort of speaks to, you know, the, the importance of sensitization and awareness. And I kind of can identify with, you know, your, your experience. Yeah, Missy, thank you for sharing. Um, I remember back back uh, in 2014, 2015, my NYC year, where I, I served with um, an organization that, you know, carried out, that had like, you know, uh, programs for maternal and child health, and we carried out multiple cervical cancer screening. And since 2014 till now, I honestly, you know, I haven't been involved or been aware of of, of much more that's been going on with regards to this global strategy. So I think it sort of casts a spotlight or highlights you know, how, the dearth in information, right? About what's happening and what we need to do. So I'd like to take uh, two more responses before Dr. Oge takes the floor. Um, Kabiru, Hello. would you like to speak? Okay, okay, someone has unmuted. Go ahead, thank you for yeah, good responding. Good afternoon. My good name afternoon. is uh, Dr. Abbas Tadeo Wellington. Welcome, I'm Dr. the Wellington. Cancer Control Coordinator for the Lagos State Ministry of Health. Amazing. I just want to provide some information about um, um, the interventions that we have um, with regards to the control of cervical cancer in the state. Yeah, we've heard about the WHO strategy, which is, um, like I always say, right about time. It's never too late to start. Yes, absolutely. We're thankful that we have started. Actually, in the state, we have um, a cancer screening program that is well established in the state. We actually started in um, about 2014. Um, we do cervical cancer screening and breast cancer screening for women of childbearing age in the states. Um, but um, over time, um, the number that we screen over the years sort of dwindles due to um, mm -hmm. availability of um, funding. But um, since January 2021, this year, we've started screening. We have 62 state health facilities where we do free cervical cancer screening. We do VIA screening, 
I will do HPV DNA screening. And these are, these are totally free for the women. Now we have about um, 20 general hospitals, two tertiary facilities and 40 primary health centers where the services are available. In addition to this, we also do, um, like um, Dr. Oge said, I really like um, what she mentioned about um, screening. We don't just screen, we also treat, which is the beauty of having, like she said, the very affordable DIA screening technique, which is what we do in the state for now. The women that we screen using VIA, we also treat them using thermal ablation. And then we even go as far as providing lip. And then we refer them. If we find a woman that has a lesion that needs further management, we refer to our oncologist. That is ongoing in the state right now. So the state is definitely keyed into this strategy. And um, this okay. is ongoing right now. Thank you, we Dr. Want to, Wellington. So far, we've screened um, over 10,000 women. And um, we want to um, improve on this. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. We want our women to willingly, you know, just like she said, yeah, we haven't gotten there. I mean, we haven't gotten to the level of, oh, you have a preset um, reminder that tells you every two years, every three years that you need to go for your screening. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of the screenings that we do nowadays seems to be pushed out to our women that, oh, you must come for screening. You must come from screening. You have very few women that willingly go for screening on their own. Usually mm -hmm. it's something that we push out on to them, the women to demand for these services. We want to improve the advocacy on this matter, and then we want to improve how we educate and inform the women about seeking out screening on their own so that we can mm -hmm. catch this cancer early. That is the truth. We catch it early, we can treat it well. That is the truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Much. Wellington. That's Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing, giving us this insight as to what uh, Lagos State is doing. And well done, you know, on the great work. My question for you, though, is um, seeing as some of the things you mentioned about improving advocacy, you know, improving, upscaling the numbers. Do you see this changing in, in like, you know, in the next one, two years, you know, improving advocacy specifically? You know, what can we do to take what little actionable steps can we take to get to that point? Because, you know, like you said, there's really never any um, there's, it's, it's not too late to start. Right. That's what you said earlier. So it's not too late to actually start, you know, uh, improving our advocacy, reaching out to people, uh, informing them, send, sending them pre preset reminders. You know, I remember um, early in the pan pandemic, when the pandemic started, you know, those reminders that the NCDC typically shares to people. So, how what's 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 the possibility? What what are, what do you see? What are the, what's the potential for this to to kick off? And this is using Lagos State as a case study right now. What do you see? You know, uh, what's the room for improvement? And what actionable steps can we begin to take now to get you know the ball rolling? Okay. Um. Before um, um January twenty twenty one, cervical cancer screening services were not routine services that were available in our facilities um, at no cost to the client. But now that, you know, what we've tried to do is we've tried to integrate it into our family planning services and um, our other outpatient services in our facility so that every woman that walks in that seeks any kind of service in the facility has the opportunity to get a rectal cancer screen at the same time. So that is one thing that mm. we're leveraging on, mm. leveraging on existing services that we have in our facilities and then okay. another thing we're trying to do is, you know, like I always tell everybody, government cannot do it all. It is, um, it is, um, I would like put it now, mm -hmm. uh, um, a wrong Hold idea that, have, that government has all the resources. Government can do everything. Government cannot do it all. I mean, when we're talking about things like advocacy, improving awareness, health education, things like that, this is where our CSOs and our NGOs come into play. This is where they can make a massive impact. This is where they can, you know, preach this gospel that look. Even though mm -hmm. we might not have the, the, the resources to provide these services, but they are available in the health facilities. Why don't you mm -hmm. go and seek these services? They are free and they are there for you to access. Mm -hmm. This is where, I mean, this is where, when I say we need all hands on deck, everybody. On deck. I mean, this, this is a platform. I mean, I know a lot of people listening to me probably have not heard about this. They don't know that these services are available in our health facilities in the States and they are free of charge. 
And any woman can walk in and get screened without paying a cobble. And then you walk out, even, I'm telling you, even as far as getting the thermal ablation, getting the leap done, you don't pay a cobble. It is free. And you stay for the woman. Now, I've already gotten how many people now that I'm very sure will be more than happy to preach this gospel somewhere that, oh, do you know this service is available in Lagos State? You need to check Legal it out. State. You need to check it out. You know, things like that. So this, I mean, taking, um, um, having an opportunity like platforms like this to preach this and let people know that, look, this service is available. And then of course, you know, whether we like it or not, to be able to push out information in massive, having massive impact, it costs some money. And then the kind of, yeah. so we can get support. We can get funding to be able to do these things. Yeah, it takes doing a lot, but we always know that there's always room for improvement. There's always yeah. room for additional support that can come in to help us do what we're trying to do in the state. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wellington. So I, I think that it, what, what this conversation does for us, it also highlights, you know, some of the, you know, steps that we can start to take, you know, for example, um, Abby, if, you know, I'm sorry, I feel like I murdered your name right there, but the person just shared a comment that, you know, can we use most, most, most women, you know, even the low, low income brackets, you know, have a mobile phone, just having a base, just the basic information through their phone, you know, social media as well, you know, just to get those reminders, you know, these are things that we can improve on. So thank you so much, Dr. Wellington for sharing and well done on the great work you're doing. Dr. Oge, I, I, I seem to have hijacked your mic for quite a, an extended period of time. My apologies. No, um, no, this is very interesting, <laughs> actually. I, uh, I'm i very, very excited about what uh, the information Dr. Wellington has shared, which is yeah. why I said, you know, I'm not here as, you know, sort of giving out just information because I was aware that there might be one or two updates from people in the audience. And Dr. Wellington has just, uh, you know, given us a most interesting uh background to what's going on in Lagos State, obviously Lagos State uh, at the yeah. moment. Um, so, you know, it's amazing. I've uh, looked at some of the, the points uh, you've also made in terms of which, which way forward. And regardless yeah. of the fact that, yes, we agree that the government can't do everything. The honest truth is the government has the most, um, how do I put it, sort of structures in place to put out information. So the government might not be able to fund everyone right now, even though long term, I hope they will, because other countries are doing it. But importantly, the education and awareness. And I think that's yes. where the problem is. So Dr. Wellington has just told us that there are over 62 facilities, there's 62 facilities where women can walk in and, mm -hmm. you know, get cervical and breast, um, you know, uh, procedures done, screening done. But this information is very contained in a very small sphere because we are in the oncology space and this information has not really, you know, expanded out to I mean, others. Yes. Unless you're in that primary healthcare center, you know, and you go for your antenatal or your family planning, you don't necessarily know that it exists. And so my question is, I think the government still has the responsibility to do the education and awareness, whether it's partnering with uh, private facilities, NGOs, foundation, there might be, you know, a room for us to have a joint sort of meeting to say, this is what we're doing. How can we work together to make this, you know, so the different uh, socioeconomic groups or I know for a fact that if it's in the private setting, a lot of the women who come in from you know, middle class, uh, upper class, they tend to do the LBC, which is a liquid-based uh, cytology, which is a gold standard. But like Dr. Wendington mentioned, you know, you, you, not everyone can afford that. We're looking at cost-effective methods. So how yeah. do we work together? How do we even affect the referral pathway as well? You know, there are people who come to the private sector and find they can't afford it. How do we then send them down to the, you know, across to the either the um, general hospitals? This is information that should be shared collectively. It's it's a collective effort. So yes. you know, um, I'm, I would really dearly love to catch up with Dr. Wellington after this just to talk some more. Um, the other thing is, I think there was a question. Yeah, there was a question. Um, from Yemisi, thank you very much. Uh, and it was actually, how can the general public be made aware? And I think in a way we've touched on it, 
Dr. Yes. Fako Unda mentioned about the mobile, you know, mobile information. We saw what we could do during the pandemic. Absolutely. You know, Nigeria has been commended, actually. In fact, I have friends in the US and the UK, and they just kept saying, you people seem a lot more organized <laughs> than we have been. We seem so confused. So we can do this. We really can do this, and everybody has a phone. So if, for instance, the Lagos State Ministry of Health, you know, Dr. Wellington, this information is bulk SMS out to everyone um, to say, listen, at your primary health care center, you can get this done, it's free. And the magic word is free, you know. Yes. Or your general <laughs> hospital, you can get this done. Or your tertiary hospital, you know, the teaching hospitals, you can get this done free. But the point is, people don't know. People don't know that this is actually going on. And I, I think for me, the first uh, step is the education and awareness and the collaboration between the different aspects of the, you know, the healthcare cadre. The primary care should be talking to the secondary care to be talking to the tertiary care. And, you know, there should be a, a, an exchange of information so that, you know, you know where to refer, people know where to go. And if we as a practitioner don't know, then the public will not know. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Ogian. Just something to add to what you've said is also the importance of data. And I'm reiterating this because yeah. even in the collaboration and conversation across the different cadres of um, you know, the healthcare uh, sector, if the primary is not giving the accurate, or is not collecting, collecting data to give to feed the secondary, you know, secondary can't feed tertiary to also impact, you know, either their services or, yeah. you know, their outcomes. So it's important for us to to have a holistic picture of what's happening, but we need to have that holistic picture by the data that we see and the data that we collect. So that's something very important as well to just bring to the fore. Thank you. Please go ahead, Dr. Okay, okay. I, I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, okay. I'm just going to go to the chat group or if there's okay, any... Quick, quick, quick. Yes. Quick one from Ola Oluwapo uh, Adebola. This person is asking, can we get a list of some of the facilities where cervical and breast cancer screening can be done for free. So what we can do is um, we can reach out to Dr. Wellington following this session to just get sort of like that information. And then we can we can share this information out, you know, on our platform so that more people get to know about what's really happening. So Dr. Wellington, um, I, I would kindly reach out to you at the end of the session to just uh, take this conversation further. Thank you very much. So Dr. Ogi, the floor, the floor, the floor is yours. Okay, I think we're, well, we're far, I, I, far outshot our time, but uh, let's see uh, what your other question or thoughts are just to wrap up the session. Okay, so to be honest, I think I have touched on a number of the things I wanted to discuss. Um, I, I also said I was going to go back to this picture here and what we are doing. And again, it's all about the public uh, awareness, uh, the education. So at our facility, we tend to be quite strong with um, themed months, you know, cancer uh, themed months um, activities. And the WHO to commemorate this uh, one year launch has actually um, invited people to send in a photo of you doing anything. And the whole idea is that they will use that to show that around the world, people are engaged with this process and so we got together and did a photo shoot. So that's the color that we wear, that's teal. And the whole idea is that every aspect of this photo is actually sending a message. So the joint hands and raised hand is, you know, collaboration, working together to achieve those targets. The smiles is, you know, the smiles were saying that cancer is not a death sentence and cervical cancer is not a death sentence. The men, there because somebody would say what the, what are the men doing with this is a female but actually the men are there as advocates so again uh, Liz you've been talking about advocacy here they are here to say that listen we have mothers we have sisters we have wives girlfriends we are here this is a joint um you know process it's not just, it's not a, just a woman's thing and their hands are also linked to show that solidarity as well so, you know, uh, there's a lot to get from here. And even though it looks like a very happy, informal picture, but actually it keys into the whole message 
of these targets for 2030. And I think that if we are all working together, you know, again, it's a pleasure to meet Dr. Wellington on this platform. And, you know, when you have forums like this, you learn and then you know yeah. where to go for information. So we need to do this more. We need to talk more to each other, find out what's going on. There shouldn't be this sort of big gap between the private sector and the public sector. We should be talking together to know, right, this is what we can do in the private sector. This is what we can do in the public sector. Where do we meet? How can we achieve a balance? And um, I think for me, that is so important. Uh, and like you said, data collection, more training of people to do these uh, screening. Um, the other concern though is the HPV vaccine. Um, I, I don't know if, um, okay, so let me put it this way. What we have in country is the Severix mm -hmm. and Severix goes for anything between 8,000, 15, 20,000, depending on where you're, get, where you're getting it. So it's not cheap really. Um, and yet we have the 90% target for 2030, which is that 90% of girls should be vaccinated by the age of 15 years. As far as I'm aware, this vaccination is occurring in minute pockets in the private space. And remember, we're just doing the severis, which covers 16 and 18. There's actually an even sort of wider coverage vaccine, which is the Gatacil 9, because it not only covers 16 and 18, it covers a couple of other subtypes. But you know what we have here is Severix, and we should use it. But currently, as we speak, we don't have any Severix right now in the country. So again, what do we do? How can the government help here? You know, I, I, I'm not sure. I know I hear the whole thing about the government not being able to do this alone. But there are some things that the government will have to discuss with either the foundations, NGOs, public, uh, private sector. How can we get the severis available to vaccinate the girls? Otherwise, we are going to be failing on one of the targets. In uh, 2030, we won't be able to vaccinate 90% of girls by the age of 15 years because it's only happening in pockets. So that's the other thing I wanted to flag up. And you know, if you have teenagers in the house who haven't been vaccinated, please you know, go ahead and vaccinate them because we've seen that 99% of cervical cancer is caused by HPV. No doubt that's evidence-based, it's a fact. So primary prevention is vaccination. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Oge. Um, we